Okay, um, so let's see, do we have any attendees? Not yet. So welcome to this meeting of the Energy and Climate Action Committee in Amherst. Our mission, as always, is to find ways to advise the town around how they can uh, more quickly and effectively do an energy transition to clean energy. Um, so with that, I have to find a better way to say that, but with that, let's move on to the agenda. First item on the agenda, it's never on here, but it's always to figure out who's gonna be the note taker. Um, so let's see who was the note taker last week. Laura, I think. Um, okay, so in order, the next person would be Jesse. Yay. <laughs> you okay with taking notes, Jesse? Um, I can, I have, I'm, I need to finish. I'm, I've, I've got a little bit of overlap in my day right now. I can start taking notes in about five minutes. Okay. How about Don? He's not here. Don's not here. Who's next on the list? Hang on a minute. Um, back to the agenda. It's always in the minutes. Uh, Stella. Sorry, I have, I have Rosalind running around in the background. <laughs> okay, so maybe not. Who's next? Hold on, I keep losing it. Um, Michael here today or Tony? I feel a little bad sticking Tony with it. I'm still, still only your third meeting. Um, and I think Michael's not here today. Um, do we have a volunteer? <laughs> I can take minutes. All right. All right, Steve, thank you very much. <coughs> um, and next time we'll have to try to remember to skip down the list a little bit or um, down I should Jesse I, I'm, I'm due I'll do next time for sure okay all right oh, sorry, uh, with, with that it's time to review the minutes from last week so I have them up here I can share them review and um, share minutes share Okay, and you can all see that presumably. Yes. Make it a little bigger, maybe. You. Okay. So I read them very quickly. I've had a lot on my plate this week, but I didn't see any issues. Does anybody see anything they'd like to have changed? I'm going to go through them pretty quickly because we have a lot to cover today. Okay, you want me to go slower or faster, or if you want to just accept the minutes as they are, please make a motion. Is there a motion to accept minutes? I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the minutes as they were distributed. <clears throat> Is there a second? Wayne seconds. Um, I'll that second. has to be yeah, okay. Good. Yep, sorry. I, I, I just had to hear you. That's okay. Yeah. Um, Lori, can you stop sharing so we can have yes. everybody on screen? Thank you. Um except that this is the second time today that the share thing has gone off the top of my screen and I can't get to it. So can you just pull it away from me, Stephanie? Try to share yes. your screen. Hold on, let me. This is the second time today this has happened on this computer. I can't unshare. Uh, okay, oh. I'm gonna, hold on, it's coming. There you go. All right, now I'm gonna stop sharing. There you go. There we go. Oh, wait, Thank I you. like those kids. <laughs> All right. I do too. <laughs> um, okay, so in no particular order, Goldner. Yes. McElrath. 
Sorry, just have to yeah. unmute. Thanks. D. Uh, abstain. Gregor. Yes. Selman. Abstain. Roof. Yes. Drucker. Yes. Okay. And it's approved. Thank you. What was the count on that, Stephanie? How many uh, in favor? Uh, that was, let's see, sorry, one, two, two three, four, five, and two abstentions. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're muted, Lori. Sorry, I'm talking to myself. Um, so the next item on the agenda is really just an announcement because I don't think we have a lot of time to discuss it further today, but we did get a follow-up note um, from Sarah Ross uh, of Undaunted K-12, this group that is putting together a um, statewide coalition of uh, schools supporting um, climate work. And um, they had the first meeting on Thursday, February 8th. They're inviting us to spread, help spread the word and maybe even join the Amherst team. Um, I think the email was in the packet, right? But were the flyers also in the packet? Um, I Whatever Sarah sent us was forwarded. Uh, oh, it was forwarded to everybody. The email itself was forwarded. Okay, I so you should so. all have the that information, and I think we should probably on a later date, um, maybe even at a retreat, which we need to figure out when we're going to do that. Talk about what, if anything, we want to, how we want to interact with this new group. Um, but I wanted to just bring that to everybody's attention to make sure you all realize that we did get a follow up from Sarah. Any questions or a quick discussion or? about that i i attended the meeting they had i think it was last week wow. and um there's a lot of people attended i don't know the count but it was several dozen i think or a couple dozen off all over massachusetts nice. and then we had a short chance for those of us out in western mass in the amherst area pioneer valley i think had a chance to talk for a short bit in a breakout group and mm -hmm. basically we learned about the program learned about some initiatives shared our emails and names and contact information and more to come, I believe. Okay, cool. I'm glad you went, Steve. That's great. Yeah, I'm interested in that. There were, and there were some kids from the Sunrise Group, I believe, from the Amherst area, that um, mm -hmm. said they were hoping to reach out to ECAC, and I spoke up and encouraged them to do so. So great. maybe we'll so. hear from them soon. All right. So let's make sure we pencil that in for future agenda um, to follow up on that some more. Um, We could probably get uh, Sarah Ross to come back and give a bit better overview for this committee if we if we yep. wish. I think that was on our uh, agenda for last time to oh. invite to invite Sarah and have that. her come. Yeah. So, so maybe. Yeah, I would. Um, I would say that that would be a good next step. Okay. So we'll invite her. You know, at her convenience, but she could even be here at the next meeting if she's free then. That would be great and we can talk about a little bit more um, how we can interact brainstorm a little how we can interact okay so if there's nothing more on that i want to move to the town council liaison because we have to actually make sure we talk about that i have to get back to uh what's her name i've lost her name grismeyer um by friday um, we've been asked in the past, we've had a town council member as a liaison who tends to uh, sit in as an attendee at these meetings. Um, wait a minute, I forgot public comment. You did, yes. Because at first there was nobody here. So why don't I stop for a minute and go back and see if there's any public comment. My apologies. Anyone from the public who's interested in making a comment, please electronically yeah, raise Martha your hand. Amora, would anyone like to say something? Okay, it's not this time. We visit that at the end of the meeting. Um, okay, so back to the pretty packed agenda. Um, okay, so in the past, we've had a town council member who sat in um, as an attendee and who has um, 
uh, who has, you know, filled us in on what the council is up to and given the council some information about what we're thinking. Um, so it's a less, it's actually a formal way for us to communicate to council, which I think is pretty important. Uh, so given, given the importance of climate, you know, climate, the climate change, uh, climate change and, and our response to it, um, I think this is pretty important. Uh, so I think we should just ask Lynn to please provide us with a liaison. I don't think there's going to be much to discuss here, but I wanted to make sure we did have time to discuss it. Um, I don't think we get to request who is our liaison. Is that right, Stephanie? But no, they're just, appointed by Lynn, I believe. Yeah. So we just need to let Lynn know that, you know, we're very grateful for having had a liaison in the past and we would really like to have one again. And maybe Stephanie can speak a little bit to how the liaisons have, have uh, facilitated the work of this committee in the past. Um, do you want to have Laura, uh, Laura. ask a question first? Yep. Go ahead, Laura. No, actually, Stephanie, it might be helpful for you to go first. Sure. Okay. Um, so uh, the intent and, and this actually used to happen even before the council convened when we actually had select board members where a member would attend um, the other committee, town committee meetings. Um, I know when when we were with, um, when Stephanie O'Keefe was chair of the select board, she would often attend the conservation commission meetings. And most of the time she would just sit in the back of the room. She would listen carefully, but if there was some kind of a comment or question about procedure or policy, she was always on her phone and would read off uh, regulatory guidance, um, which was really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, moving forward when we then, uh, convened a town council and we had liaisons from the council, we've had varying degrees of participation from members. Um, Darcy Dumont was actually our liaison that was actually a member of the committee, um, a voting member of this committee. Um, and we had, we had two actually that were appointed and then that evolved into um, having um, representation from the council with a liaison that was not a voting member. So that evolved over time. And then last year, our liaison, uh, so then we had, I'm sorry, I should mention that we had um, Anna Devlin Gothier, uh, who was very actively engaged and sort of worked back and forth with the committee and the council um, to sort of bring initiatives uh, on the committee's behalf to the council. And then last year we had, um, Alicia Walker was our representative who I don't think even attended a single meeting. So their participation has, um, you know, it really is very sort of particular to who was the liaison at the time. But there is, I think, a very clear procedural format for what liaisons should and should not be doing. And that is why I think Lynn sent that along with the inquiry as to whether or not we want a liaison. And people should pay attention to that because to a larger degree, um, some of what Darcy did, some of what Anna did was not necessarily adhering to the guidelines of what the liaison should be doing. Um, so I think that was kind of Lynn's, you know, maybe rationale for including that with all of the committees to let people know, like, if you have a liaison, this is what they should be doing, which is basically mostly to attend and listen and be able to report back to the council, but not necessarily to be as actively engaging in the work of the committee as directly as might have been done in the past. Yeah, and I have to say, I thought Anna did a, a very nice job at exactly that. Um, Laura? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just going to be on my computer in a minute, so I'll be back on camera. But um, I was going to say basically what Stephanie said. I mean, but I think Darcy, I don't think we can lump Darcy into that category because she was not a liaison officially. She was mm -hmm. an actually member. member of the council. Uh, and there was other members in that regard, too. Um, yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea to have a liaison, but like... I don't think we can count on them to always bring stuff back to the council for us if they're not going to be engaged. So I just wanted to flag that. Yeah, I think it's important for us to continue when we have a particular issue that we want to bring to the attention of the council that we, we communicate it to them directly. Um, further discussion?
Um, if not, since I think the vote was on the agenda, I don't think we actually, well, maybe we should just do a motion anyway, since we usually do stuff that way here. Is there a motion to go ahead and request a liaison? I'll push that motion. Thank you, John. request a liaison. Second. I'll second that motion. Such an Hi, Tony. I'm Jesse, by the way. Oh, you guys have <laughs> not you. met yet. All right. We'll have to make sure we... We've done motions together. It's no okay. big deal. <laughs> All okay. Right. And then I'll need um, a voice vote, and please be on camera. Um, Goldner? Yes. McElrath? Yes. Bregger? Yes. Selman? Yes. Roof? Yes. D? Yes. Drucker. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Okay. It's approved. Okay. With that, um, let's go to updates. Uh, transportation. Stella? Yeah. So I reached out to the, the Pioneer. Sorry. I want to get the name right. The Pioneer... The Pioneer Valley Driving School, <laughs> um, and they do they do include anti idling as part of their curriculum, so that's great. Um, I also contacted the schools, Debbie Westmoreland, to see if uh, there could be some um, discussion of anti idling and or sharing. I mean, I shared the op ed and and suggested that that could be shared. Um, in some way that feels appropriate with the school community. And I haven't heard back from that. And then the other two places on that list that are on my list to reach out to that I haven't reached out to yet are the athletic department and Sunrise. Um, but I thought it was very encouraging that the driving school covers it. She wrote back right away. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, and I realize that uh, UMass has an idling problem, a big one actually, that the uh, students after hours especially pull into every spot on campus that has a sign that says they shouldn't be there. And they try to get away with being there by not turning their cars off, <laughs> even if they're not in the car. Um, so, <laughs> so I was thinking of writing to the parking folks at, at UMass as well. Um, if you want, Lori, I can attempt to do that. If um, Stella could provide me with the op-ed and things that you sent around to, to yeah. um, or I can get you that our... okay cool I was going to say I know a few people that work with the transportation department higher up so excellent okay I will get uh, you a link to the op-ed um, so you can send it to them that'd be fantastic okay big note there so I don't forget um any other updates on transportation, Stella? Anything we should be working on next? Well, next I'll be on parental leave. <laughs> oh, that's right. So right. I need to kind of think about wrapping things up and passing the baton. Um, yep. Is this like who, who wants to take transportation on next might be a, a good thing to discuss. That's a good question. Um, so the so the way this committee often works is since we're, we're not allowed to do things as a group or even as a group of two um you're not allowed to meet outside of outside of this committee um we have in the past sort of assigned different people to keep tabs on different issues and so for example i do heat pumps and um Dwayne has been working on solar and steve i think sometimes also does solar um and um uh, Stella has been doing transportation. <clears throat> so uh, Jesse or Tony or Laura, if one of you want to take over the transportation baton, um, there are th several things coming online. There's the new, uh, hopefully, bike um, contract, right? For for um, that that Stephanie is working on getting a new electric bike contractor into town. Um, working on electrifying the fleet, keeping track of, I think there's already a, um, some data on, on that that's been collected. So, you know, there are lots of things around transportation. There's a bike plan 
remember there's a bike and pedestrian plan in town that we thought about a little bit last year and tried to encourage the council, I think, to go ahead, please, and, and, and do. <laughs> um, so there's a lot that falls under the guise of transportation to keep track of and keep pushing on. If it's in the parameters of how much time I've spent here so far, I would actually love to um, tackle that. It goes well with a lot of the things I've been researching anyway. So it'd be helpful if I could. Cool. <laughs> All right, Tony. Um, so we can talk um, more, more about that, or I think it's okay for, um, so the way this works is, you know, you can send a uh, information to us or we can send information to you, but we can't have a discussion by, by email. So um, I think probably, what's the best way to pass the, the, the baton, Stella? Do you want to, do you have information and stuff you'd like to pass? Yeah, I, maybe I can send Tony a sort of summary of what's been done so far and what I know of that might be good things to take up. And you could do the same. Should I, am I allowed to put you in CC or should I just not put you in CC? I think you can, we you, can totally send, you can send information to Tony. You just can't talk about it, but you can just send him right. that information. Yeah. Can fine. I send it to Tony with Lori and CC? Or yes. It, yes. Okay, I'll send it to Tony with you and CC. You don't respond. Then if I missed anything, like, because I'm definitely, there's definitely stuff that's on your radar that's not on my radar. You send Tony a separate email without me and CC. <laughs> okay, right, right. I can also and Tony doesn't that. respond to either of us. Yeah. And you should include me on that. It feels very strange and antisocial, but yeah, that, <laughs> that is how it works. <laughs> um, you can include me as well, Stella. And okay. Tony, we can talk too. Um, you know, if you have questions about some of the things like the bike pedestrian plan, um, you can reach out to me. Um, also the bike share. So if you have any questions, feel free to just reach out email and we'll schedule a time right. and we can also talk about it i'll send that before the next meeting and probably we'll be at the next meeting it's like in the realm of um uncertainty but we might be able to talk about it then too that sounds great <laughs> any other transportation items i think that's it Okay, in that case, I'll just say really quickly about heat pumps, the RFP for heat pumps, Stephanie sent that to me um, uh, yesterday for comment, and it looks good to me. It's finally going out. Um, maybe Stephanie can just say a word about what you think the timeline for that will be. Um, but I'll, I'll add one thing, which is that, you know, uh, Stephanie is now also in, in training as a, as an energy trend, as a heat pump coach, as an energy transition coach. And uh, I've already done that and am uh, now TAing that course. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm rare at the bit to you know, participate in this program. Part of the program is in training a cohort of people to be able to continue the work of the RF to some extent uh, that the RFP started, at least the outreach part of it. And the, uh, to some extent, the um, advising part of it, the, the consulting part of it. Um, so that would be, you know, this is, I hope, working toward a sustainable long-term plan. It'll be a short-term contract, right? But it'll hopefully lead to a long-term ability to reach out to people and get them interested and get them to transition their homes to, to electric. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Right, you can, say can you remind us for the minutes what the RFP is for? <clears throat> It's to hire, well, it's, uh, Stephanie, why don't I let you speak to that? Sure. Um, um, so, so we have ARPA funding to launch a heat pump program, and that was to provide incentive funding to low-income residents to purchase heat pumps. And um, there was a lot of legal review that was required of the RFP that we had drafted. Uh, we got comments, but the final go-ahead, we've only received it maybe like three weeks ago, but there were additional comments from staff that they wanted edits to the RFP, which I've made. I had Lori review them. Um, and now they have to go, uh, well, now that they've been reviewed, they have to go back. The draft has to go back to the procurement officer because it has to be updated. Because the up the RFP was completely put together. It was ready to go. And then we kind of got stalled in our tracks because of the legal review. So the date goes back to like July. <laughs> so unfortunately it couldn't launch back then. So um, 
there have to be new dates added to the RFP, but then it can be released. So I'm hoping, really hoping that next week it will actually get released for real. So um, and this that's is what I'm hoping for. And this is to and hire a consultant hire. To, right. to actually do the outreach and figure out a way to get financing to low income and multi-unit houses housing, right? Low income housing. Right. So we have funding that is going to be provided. So we just have to sort of figure out the logistics of how that's going to work. Um, but we're hoping to work with a vendor who has experience um, both with Mass Save, um, but also with heat pump specific technology and programming. So uh, it's so basically the RFP is to hire a vendor. Mm -hmm. and who will help us develop the program. That's probably the best way to summarize that. Give out money, best possible job. And what, yes. What's the goal in terms of number of heat pumps installed or number of units? I don't, yeah. I mean, it depends on how, I I, I think it, it's going to depend on the time that we have and the vendor. Um, I don't think we have a set goal in mind right now. I think it's just... I mean, we sort of want to get as many as we can, but I think it's more the allocation of funding, how much funding we have and how much we want to allocate to people. Um, so I, I I, wouldn't even begin yeah. to quote numbers until we have the contractor, the vendor in place. I think that's for the response, right, to the RFP. That, Correct. That are, it will be specific enough, hopefully, to tell us what they're going to actually do and how many. Yeah, there's a request yeah. for them to provide information about them launching a program. Yeah. Right. That's partly how we're going to review them and interview them and understand what they're proposing. So, but I don't, again, I think, you know, sometimes it's easier to quote those numbers, but I think um, the funding piece is not a small piece. Like this isn't like Solarize where we weren't dealing with providing incentive other than reduced cost for bulk purchasing. Um, there's a similar kind of approach here, but I don't know how that's going to work it's a little more complicated because we're providing the funding for the purchasing of the equipment. So that's pretty cool and very important. And who will that vendor be working for? You said working with the town, working with us, the ECAC? Well, the town. So they, the town, yeah. I mean, vendors don't contract with committees. They contract no, with the town. So they will work with me, but we'll certainly, I mean, Lori is very, this is, Lori is the liaison. This is sort of similar to how Dwayne worked with the solar assessment and mapping tool. Okay. Lori will be the contact for the ECAC, the liaison, and she and I will be working closely together on this program. Right. And then she'll bring the information back to you all and you all will weigh in. I mean, I, the RFP, I think came to you. It was, it's been so long, but it, I think it did at some point, you yeah. know, you all had a look at it, but it was a while ago. Okay. So that's all pretty exciting. I'm pretty excited. Um, the next thing on the list, if there's nothing more on heat pumps, heat pump program, is the sustainability festival. So I think, Stephanie, we need to do a little planning, right? We need to at least figure out what the date is so we can mark our calendars and start thinking about who's gonna be there when. Well, the date is April 20th. Okay, let me go make sure I have it on my calendar. Pretty sure I do, but I wanna just check. Um, April 20th. And it goes from? So the event itself, it's a Saturday, and the event itself is from 10 to 4, but the setup begins, some people arrive at 7, but officially the setup is between 8 and 10. Right, and I think last year we came at 8. There There's are lots always... of details like, like where the tent comes from and, and who's going to sit at the table when, and I don't think we need to do that right now, but probably at the next meeting, because we'll be two months away, we should you should start thinking about what your time might look like on that day and signing up for slots. But also we need ideas for how we can most effectively participate. So I was hoping to have a little bit of a discussion about that. Unless Stephanie, did you have some other idea or well I, I would just say that we have so many initiatives that are being launched right now, right? So um you know, we have the um, 
you know, the RFP is going up for the heat pump program. That's going to be one of the biggest things, I think, to really be focused on promoting and educating people about that. And the other thing is the community choice aggregation, Valley Green Energy. That's another another program that, you know, those two things are really big initiatives that we want to promote as much as possible. We want to, you know, they require education um, and outreach and engagement and, you know, at a really high level. So especially the CCA people are automatically opted in. So we need to let people know about that. So everyone's going to get a notification in the mail, but that's not enough. We need to tell them because people need to keep hearing it. So um, that's big. And then also the opportunity with the heat pump program. I think that's going to be something we need to um, really get out the word out about. And then also the um, community dashboard. You know, we want to, uh, I was thinking it would be great to have a computer set up at your table and just like have people go through it and show them the site and, you know, maybe walk them through how to use it and um, what are the features of that tool as well. So that's that another. Cool. So those three things I think were probably a lot. Um, and then yeah. I, Tony and uh, Stella will be gone by then, but Tony will probably maybe have some ideas about transportation. And um, I'm hoping that we will have a vendor by the time the sustainability festival is happening, which we should because we want, actually want to launch the program again by that date. But um, hoping that we will be able to have a vendor or the vendor present with information about Valley Bike. But if not, that's another opportunity as well. Well, so, gee, we just don't have much to talk about, do we? <laughs> yeah. So hopefully Valley Bike will be there. I presume that the CCA, some there will probably be a table but you know, from the CCA itself, right? Representing the CCA. No? Um, there I don't know for sure. Um that's why I'm saying, I mean, the ECAC has been, I think, yeah. you know, kind of the the conduits really are the primary conduits for that effort. So it is appropriate for yeah. you all to have information and there may be a separate table for it as well, which is fine. I mean, I don't think it's bad to have multiple um, opportunities for information. For no, I agree. I agree. I, I was just, I'm hoping that we, I, I would love to see somebody there. What is it called? Valley green energy, Valley green yeah. energy, but Valley green energy is essentially the three communities that are the voting members. So it's Northampton, Pelham and Amherst. Uh, and then we have some community advocates who have been involved in the process and whether they want to do that or not, I have no idea. Um, you know, officially, officially Valley Green Energy are the three towns, you know, and there is some community advocacy that's part of that. Um, LEA might want to um, potentially table and have information about it, but I absolutely think the ECAC should be the okay. ones that are kind of like the official table for, for that. And there may be, you know, I'm, the town has a table, but when I'm there, I'm usually running around an awful lot. So I'm not at the table the whole time. So I think if you all had information, I think that would be important. Okay. Yeah. It sure would be nice to pull someone in who's been involved in the CCA effort from the, from the get go. Um, but yeah, we can certainly do that. I'm also, I also have this vision of a, of a booth with a, you know, a big sign overhead that says heat pump advice, five cents. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would be happy to sit there all day and talk to people about heat pumps and give them, you know, the first round of advice on what they should be doing. Mostly it's getting information, you know, talking to people, asking them about their situation, what their interest is, what they're interested in, the, the, the four C's they call it in, you know, their comfort cost, what, what, they're, what they're interested in uh, in the way of uh, a new heating system and then uh, try to get them talking a little bit about uh, what might be appropriate and who in the area contractors to call and stuff like that. I'd love to have those sorts of conversations with people. And I think if I put a sign out like that, we probably could. Uh, and that would also give us a way of advertising the coming heat pump program. Um, so I could see doing that, for example. Um, so we got a lot there. We got the dashboard. We're going to want a computer. I guess we have wireless in the in the green, right? If it's not raining, having a there's wireless. There's wireless and also there's um, access to electricity. Okay. We just need a cord. Stephanie, is the, the Valley Clean Energy, is it Valley Green Energy, right? Valley Green Energy. Green yeah. Energy. Is, is that going to be the publication? 
publicity for that? Is that going to be started by April? Like, will residents receive stuff in the mail about the program? It or all depends on when the DPU okay. approves it. So, so the application is, um, let's see, where are we? We're February. It's quite possible it will be approved by then. Okay. But, you know, um, but if it hasn't officially launched, we can still just have some basic information yeah. about it. Great. Um, you know, we have to be careful about how information is transmitted to the public. The DPU is very particular about mm -hmm. what we say and don't say. Um, there are official letters that are included, but right now all of that is being reviewed by the DPU. So until we get the official launch, we could have some general information that it's coming. Okay. Mm -hmm. If it if it officially launches, then we'll have some very specific um, formatted letters and things that will be available to use. Well, that's great. That's great news that it's moving along yeah. that fast. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, it's exciting. We did not anticipate that they would move as quickly as they are, but we don't, I mean, we don't know yet, but right. um, it seems to be that they are yeah. moving quickly with ours, which is great. All right. So I think, um, sorry, Jesse has his hand up. Oh, yeah, Jesse, go ahead. Sorry. You're muted. Yeah. So I, I, um, I could be available to help set up and I have a, I have a tent and <laughs> I could make one of these if you want. And, and it could I, say, that would be great. That would you be could great. say en energy and climate help <laughs> five cents and a little doctors in. And yes. I know the yes, lead you please. do. Have, you, you do have a PhD <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love it. <laughs> so I, I would be happy to, to, I can, set up the tent in that table and, and sign to look like that you're gonna have um, that would be great that would be great thank you jesse i i will take you, you up on the offer <laughs> my pleasure and everybody younger than you will be going what's that yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true how many how many people not you know my daughter read read um peanuts but how many kids do nowadays i don't know Oh, well, anyway, it'll still be funny, even if they don't have any idea what it's about. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so uh, I think next time we'll try to actually assign, so for next time on the agenda, keep this on the agenda, oh. let's try to assign spots. So last year, I think we did like, you know, two hour slots of two people each and pretty much filled up the day. Um, and I'm willing to stick around for longer, uh, as long as nothing horrible happens that weekend <laughs> that takes me away from town or something like that. But I'm planning on being here, the, being there the whole day, pretty much. So, um, all right. Any more discussion about the sustainability festival? Do you want to see us do anything else today, Stephanie? Oh, go ahead, Steve. I was just curious if if Stephanie needs more help from ECAC on organizing or running the entire festival. It seems like that's something right. ECAC could be involved in, mm -hmm. not just manning, having our own booth, but helping organize, run, or implement the festival. Yeah, right. I So, so much of it for me is done via email and I've got such a, like a rhythm with it, but that's not to say that I couldn't use some help. So I do have two staff members that are going to be doing some, um, you know, some uh, help with some of the specific details like porta potties and possibly with the marking of the common and that kind of thing. Um, I might need help in getting some entertainment, um, maybe coordinating that piece might be helpful. But again, like I, everything is done by email. So it's really not what takes my time is more like literally the week before the event or the two weeks before the event that gets a little hairy because people are in and out and dropping out. And it's, you know, in terms of assigning people where they should be and all that can get a little sketchy. So um, if there's something very specific, I will ask you, like, for instance, I often have to reach out to Amherst college about the parking lot, you know, parking for vendors. I might ask for, for that help this year but i mean again it's an email it doesn't i look right. up last year's i send it off again so i'll let you know but i i think honestly it's not 
it's an, especially now that it's um, scaled down so much more. I will let you know though, for sure. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll put that Thank in the minutes so that you and the rest of us will remember. We may get called on to help you out. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. I mean, what I might do is just like pick on certain people if it seems like it's something that they might be able to help with or they have a connection with a certain person or yeah. group. Were they high school students last year who helped with the loading and unloading? They were it so was, great. They It was Amherst College, and that was the best group <laughs> of students we have ever had. They were amazing. And they were amazing. Yeah, they they were, were football great. players because yeah. Angela Mills, who is the executive assistant to the town manager's husband, is the coach of the Amherst College uh, football yeah. team. Cool. And so they, he was there as well. And Angela was there and they did an amazing job helping out. And Angela and I spoke already and she's going to get them on it again this year. So oh, incredible. They were incredible. They were amazing. Like just amazing. <laughs> they made everything go so smoothly. It was wonderful. So yeah. And we'll have them back again this year. My, they were pulling things out of my trunk before I needed them pulled out. Before I knew I <laughs> yeah. needed them pulled out. <laughs> yeah, they were great. They yeah. were really great. They were really on the, on the wall. Okay. Um, next thing on the table. Anything else for this festival for today? Is there anything else we should cover, Stephanie? Or I don't think so. Just the date, which is, again, April 20th from 10 to 4. Okay. And Don LaRufa just joined us. Is that Yes. Our and Adam, they are our presenters from Revision, Sunbug okay. slash Revision. And Adam, there you are. Okay, good. So let's give that a few more minutes. Um, uh, so Adam and and, uh, and Don, welcome. <laughs> um, we're Thank finishing. Yep, yeah, we're just finishing up the ECAC meeting now, and you will start right on time at five thirty. So um, <clears throat> uh, next thing on the agenda, if there's nothing else for the sustainability festival, is the ECAC retreat. There's a lot going on, but there's always the question of what should we focus our efforts on and how are we gonna go about doing it? And it's useful now that we have new members to plan a retreat sometime. I think maybe for today, we should maybe try to narrow down to a few dates. Are there days that folks would like to propose for doing this? Do we usually do it on a Wednesday at the same time? Oh, Stephanie, go ahead, yeah. Sorry, just one thing I wanted to say is that when you have the retreat, technically it's um a pu it's public. It has to be posted publicly, um, and I I'm I sort of recalling that the last one we did was actually virtual. I can't recall if it was yeah. if anyone else remembers that, um, but you could do it virtually or you can actually do it physically. It just has to be posted. Okay, so, so you can meet in person. Is there any difference between a retreat and a regular meeting then? Um. I mean, yes, in that it's a very specifically focused on planning. Um, you're not, um, you know, and there's a, <clears throat> it's, can be longer, you know, sometimes it's longer. Um, it's more of a casual, you could have a potluck. It's, you know, it's more of a bonding opportunity. It's a, it's different than just a regular meeting. Like yeah, there isn't public comment. Um, your agenda is very specific to the work that you all want to sort of focus on. So, um, but I just wanted to say that up front. Uh, so when you're thinking about dates, you also may want to determine whether you want to do it virtually or in person, in which case then I have to find a room for you to meet in. Right. So are there, did, go ahead. We did do it one, one year. We did something one year at the South yeah, Amherst. What, was it the library? Munson, is, it, is that Munson, Munson library. library? Yeah, that was your. That was when the ECAC very first. Yeah, got together, convened that's, way in the beginning. That's a good. That's a good room, in my opinion, mm -hmm. for a group this size. It's plenty of space. Um, simple. It's easy to get to. It's accessible. The town owns it. Um, mm -hmm. I I would make a vote for. For that, if it's possible, I think it'd be, I think it'd be nice. That sounds good to me. Any other? I, I think having something in person would be great. And when you say you have to post it, you mean that people can come and listen to the retreat the same way they would for a, okay. Yes. Um, um, and also, um, you can do it on a week. You know, you could do it on a Saturday. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be your regularly scheduled meeting time. In fact, I would recommend against 
doing it at your regularly scheduled meeting time or if you do make it in lieu of a regular meeting, obviously. Any thoughts on that, on timing? I would say that it, it's important that everyone be there. And as someone that I'm pretty sure I missed the last one, um, I, I think if we can have it so that everyone's there, I think that's also really great. And therefore, using that Wednesday slot will potentially increase the chances of everyone being able to be there. Um, just eliminating a meeting and, and taking those two hours I in a slightly a doodle, different way. Sorry, I could send a doodle poll. Yeah, that would be great. Um, for upcoming Wednesdays only? It's, what do people think about doing it on a Wednesday evening in lieu of a regular meeting? How about I just put some dates out there? Yeah, I mean, for me, times. It, yeah, it's just weekends are harder to um, know far in advance of whether you're going to be around or not. Yeah, me too. So why don't I just keep it focused to, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Didn't mean to. I would say do a mix of both. Well, I understand the benefit of doing it on Wednesday. And I also find when weekends hard to plan, I am also tired on Wednesday afternoons <laughs> and not in a mindset of like forward thinking and being creative about how we want to focus our time. So I think it would be, I agree with Jesse. We should try to find a time most people would meet. I also would really love for us to meet in person. Yeah. Okay. So. Other thoughts on that? Is it is it a consensus that we meet in person or is it, would anyone rather meet virtually? I agree, meeting in person would be a lot nicer. Yeah, I fully agree on that, yeah. And I think a time when we're not tired would be great too. So I'd like to meet in 1994. <laughs> um, like this is the last time I <laughs> I was not even born yet. <laughs> uh oh. I was five. And probably wasn't tired. <laughs> You'd have plenty of energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, other than a Wednesday, should we try for earlier on a Wednesday? Are we thinking that? <laughs> no, no, definitely no, because we have to work. So, um, why don't we, is there anyone who's still, I mean, obviously I, th I think I'm always more awake on weekends, but I'm also less likely to be available on weekends. So um, maybe we can try, do you want to try a mix of, is there anyone interested in us trying a mix of Saturdays and Wednesdays on this dual poll? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I will do a mix of um, weekend uh, dates and times and evenings. Okay. And also stick to Wednesday. time block Wednesdays. Yeah. So just Wednesday, Wednesday evenings. All right. And that, then some weekends. Lucky, no. All right. Yeah. And then time frame. Do we want a three hour meeting? Maybe with like a break in between? Yeah. Let's schedule for three hours. And then um, if we need less, we need less. If we, you know, more than that, I don't think, I don't think anyone's going to be up for. <laughs> okay. All right. Do we have a sense of what topics we will want to discuss at such a retreat? You can put this on the agenda for the next yes. meeting. Okay. And just I, think that's, I think that's planning, something. you know, yeah. continue the planning. Right. Just wanted to get started on it this time. So that's agenda for next time. Okay, and are we thinking March, April, May, or are we thinking farther out than that, or, or is March too soon? I think, why don't I just put dates out and- Okay, see what we'll happens. see how it falls, people's yep. schedules. All right, dates that work for you, Stephanie. Or in general. <laughs> All right, um, back to- <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear what's going on in here, but my little dog, I'm not playing with him. So he's throwing his toy around the room playing by himself because I won't throw it for him. It's squeaking it. I don't, it's making a really nasty squeaking noise. 
<laughs> All right, back to, uh, okay, so where are we here? We did the retreat um, and we're up to the, the education series now. We have just a few minutes. So why don't we do staff updates, Stephanie, in the next few minutes and then come back at, at right at 5.30 to the education series. Okay, uh, I think most of what I would update you on has been said, but just to recap, um, so the RFP has been drafted. It will go to the procurement officer to be revised and updated. Hopefully it will be released next week. Um, mm -hmm. The CCA, as you know, is still being reviewed. The application is being reviewed by DPU, but it seems to be moving along faster than we anticipated. So we hope that it will be released or approved um, possibly within six months. Um, or less. So there's that. And then um, what was the other thing? Um, I'm sorry, the, um, the bike share program, we received some proposals. We've reviewed them. We have made um, sort of ranked our top provider, but we haven't opened the price proposals yet. Those are being opened this week. The community is going to take a look at those and then have a meeting on Friday and see if the proposals sort of line up with our ranking. Um, we're hoping that our number one choice is not going to price themselves right out of being in the running. Um, so that's moving forward. Um, let's see what else. Um, I think those are kind of the the big, more major items for right now. Is there a target, Stephanie, on the B Valley Bike Share Program? Is there like a hope to select a vendor by a certain date in order to oh, get it running for the spring? Yes, or the it's, yes absolutely. Um, yeah, we would hope to be, um, so if we select a vendor, then there would have to, we have to, um, well, first we're going to open the price proposals, though it's likely going to be interviews with the top few candidates, prospective vendor candidates. Um, so I would think we're hoping to have things up and running in April. Um, certainly the, the hope is to have the system completely up and running by the end of April. That might be wow. um, ambitious, <laughs> but um, that's the hope. So in any case, the idea is that it will at least have started to launch in April. Now, starting to launch doesn't mean necessarily that every community is all going to start at the same time. They have to phase it, right? So when they launch, they, you know, focus on a community at a time. So I'm not sure when that means Amherst would be uh, online again, but the idea is that everybody hopefully should be up and online by the end of April. That's exciting. That's, That's great. Yeah, it's exciting. very exciting. Um, yes, um, we've really missed it. It's, but, and there's so much interest, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in other communities wanting to join too. So we're excited. We're hopeful. Is the hope that it will use the same hardware that the previous vendor was using the same bike racks and bikes? Exactly. Because we own those. Okay. So we, okay. that's, that was part of the proposal was that the, whoever the vendor is would be able to integrate the existing um, hardware and software because we have a back-end software program that kind oh, okay. of um, keeps it all together. So um, we're hoping that we can use that technology still um, and because we do know who the um, software provider is and it might be a matter of coordinating with the new vendor to work with them. Okay. That's nice to know. Yes. Yeah, that's the hope. I mean, again, you know, things, it might be sort of, they start out with what we have and then there's an evolution to their own material, you know, program, um, bikes and hardware. But for right now, we're starting with what we have. Pretty cool. Um, we might have time. That's it for staff updates. We might have time for just one ECAC member update before starting our webinar um, with uh, Sunbug Solar Revision on uh, solar canopies and EV charging. Anyone want to offer an update?
we can come back to it afterwards if not and then afterwards we'll continue the agenda um with uh we've been sort of keeping items for the next meeting agenda as we go and uh we'll have public comment after the sunbug presentation before we adjourn um so I do have one thing I want to just bring up as an update. Uh, one of the things that's come up here several times is the fact that an awful lot of folks are taking out trees uh, in their little in, in neighborhoods in Amherst to put up solar. And the question has come up, well, how bad is that? You know, if you're taking out one tree, it's probably not so bad. If you're taking out a small forest, um, you know, and changing the character of a neighborhood, maybe that's not so great. So I started looking around a little bit and had Energy Sage send me a bunch of quotes. And I think that, and I'd love to get input from Dwayne and Steve on this sometime, but I think that their estimates are far off for how much CO2 is saved and how much money might be saved uh, by putting solar, for example, on my house, um, <laughs> which is in the woods, <laughs> unless I take down my neighbor's trees. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I wouldn't take down any trees. So um, I, I starting a conversation with them about this and scheduled some time with one of their, it's just one of their consultants on Monday. And if they don't have answers, I will up it a little bit and see if I can speak with somebody in charge there. Um, Google Sunroof offers similar services and are about an order of magnitude lower in both regards, CO2 estimates and price, the amount of money I would save. <laughs> so it's not a small difference. And Google Sunroof jibes more with what I back at the envelope calculate. So um, at any rate, just something to throw out there that I noticed this week. Um, yeah, I think that's a, it's a rich topic. That's going to take a fair bit of discussion. I think it's going to be very site specific as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to look at it with you, Lori, just in terms of the, the assumptions and range of assumptions. And I, I'd love to know what goes into their assumptions. And with that, <laughs> uh, let me go ahead and introduce um, Don uh, LaRufa. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You did. Well done. And Adam, is it Thorell? Or Thorell? It's pronounced Thorell. Yeah, rhymes with Thorell. Um, with, Revi uh, with Revision Energy, who are going to talk to us about solar canopies and EV charging. Um, you have the floor. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Lori, first and foremost, I'll say uh, your background noise sounds like every night when my wife and I finally sit down to watch TV, watch the news. That's when our golden retriever decides he's going to squeak every toy that he possibly can in front of us. So not, you're not alone. Uh, great. But yeah, thank you for the introduction and, and thanks everyone for. Uh, Ah, there he is, or she is, uh, for affording us the time to uh, speak with you this evening. Um, <clears throat> uh, the request was made to talk about uh, EV charging and, and solar canopies, as Lori mentioned. So um, I'll just give a quick background on myself. As you mentioned, my name is Don LaRufa. Um, I've been with Revision Energy for a little over seven years at this point, which is uh, uh, kind of surprising and exciting for me. My uh, background was always in the uh, the corporate world. and I made the decision, I think, like a lot of us in renewable energy do at one point, to said, I think I need to do something that, that I feel is a little bit more impactful. So uh, I work out of our North Andover office, um, joined and focused on commercial um, solar projects uh, for the first seven, six and a half, seven years, and then made the pivot recently to focus on um, commercial EV charging infrastructure in Massachusetts. Um, you know, Massachusetts has always had a very bullet clean energy plan. Um, so I almost, you know, say we're at the point now with EV charging, with the amount of, of focus and incentives that are available, um, kind of like where we were with solar um, in Massachusetts, you know, maybe 15 years ago. So, you know, over the course of time, because of the strong energy plan Massachusetts has, you see how much solar has, has been installed. And uh, like I said, we're right at that beginning point here with, uh, with EV charging. So I'm uh, super excited to be leading the charge, which I guess the pun is intended on that. Uh, with revision. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll let Adam introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Uh, I see some familiar faces in the crowd. Nice to see you tonight. Um, I have been building solar systems, designing solar systems in the Valley for the last 16 years. Uh, live with my 
wife and children in Montague. And so I'm uh, grateful for you all having us in tonight to um, help flesh out these ideas around EV charging and solar carport canopies. Thanks for having us. Don's going to kick off with EV charging and then I'll follow up with, with carports. And um, we certainly welcome uh, Q&A along the way. So if you have questions, feel free to, to raise your hand and we'll, we'll tackle them as we go. Yeah, thanks. I couldn't say it better myself. So you bear with me here. I'm not nearly as familiar with Zoom as I am with Microsoft Teams, uh, but I'm going to share my screen. Which I hope you can all see. Okay, looking good. Come on. Perfect. Um, and how do I just... I just the, the the view here with our, our participants. I just don't want it to cover up too much of our slide here. Adam and I tried to change this earlier. Well, oh boy, I'm going to leave it as is. Actually, you know what I'll do? Which I hate to do. But I'm going to minimize. I'm going to minimize the group here. Uh, but to Adam's point, certainly uh, have this be interactive. Um, we, we've left. We've afforded time at the end for for Q and A. But certainly, as uh, I'm going through my piece here, uh, chime in and. Uh, uh, happy to interact accordingly. Don, that's specifically yeah. for the committee to ask questions during the presentation, but the public, we're saving that for the end. Okay, wonderful. Great. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, I'm going to start out talking about EV charging here. Thanks again. Um, when, you know, part of my, my, my presentation will, you know, kind of cover um, electric vehicles in general. We talk a lot about uh, the technology and then more importantly, the way that vehicles can interact um, to the grid and, and other devices uh, differently than you would think with a traditional vehicle. So, you know, some of the, the benefits of, of, of electrified transportation um, and, you know, it's, it's funny, I'm sure, I'm assuming there's a, a number of electric vehicle drivers on the call today, uh, which is great. And it, it's funny, if, if you, if, EV drivers love to talk about, you know, the the, the difference in the benefits uh, of EV, uh, of driving an EV. And, and a lot of that's different for, you know, some different individuals. So, you know, overall, you'll, a common thread as you'll hear, it's, it's just a better driving experience. Um, and whether that means it's, you know, the vehicle is, is quiet, uh, doesn't have any engine noise or uh, as much road noise to contend with. Um, you know, one of my colleagues is from the UK. Um, he's a big Formula One fan. So he always talks about the performance of electric vehicles and, you know, like kind of how quick off the line they are and the way that they handle and um, just the way uh, uh, speed seems different without gearing. Um, but naturally there's, you know, the, the reduction in greenhouse gas and emissions that everyone always feels good about. And uh, certainly a lot less uh, maintenance that's required compared to a, a traditional gas vehicle, um, whether, you know, you're talking about oil changes or uh, fluids that need to be, uh, you know, maintained and, and changed. Um, and, and the big picture is is really um, a lot of security around, you know, energy, you know, quote unquote, fueling your vehicle um, and, and driving a lot of independence um, in that capacity. So the next uh, picture and slide here just talks a little bit about, you know, uh, where we are today with vehicles. And, um, you know, certainly technology changes quickly, um, as we all very know, and, and it wasn't uh, too long ago you know, part of the conversation around electric vehicles was, you know, well, you know, you know, how far can you go in the car? You know, what type of what type of range does, does the battery have? And, you know, it's super exciting to, to see today that uh, there's at least a dozen, you know, vehicle models from various manufacturers that uh, all boast a, a range of, you know, 250 miles per more uh, or more per charge. So, you know, the norm has certainly changed. Uh, with with the vehicles themselves, um, and that's cascading, you know, globally. I mean, we're at the point now that in 2023, uh, one in five EVs, or I'm sorry, one in five vehicles that were sold globally uh, were full plug-in electric vehicles. Um, you know, national, uh, a little closer to home here in the United States, uh, in 2023, there were uh, nearly 2.5 million um, EVs registered. And, you know, Massachusetts, California leads the charge, which California typically does with, uh, you know, green and clean technologies. But uh, Massachusetts certainly won't be, be far behind. I mean, part of that 
you know, bullish energy plan I, I referenced earlier, uh, you know, Governor Baker uh, uh, signed in that uh, by the year 2035, um, any new vehicle that's going to be sold in Massachusetts will be electric. You know, there's essentially there will be a ban on uh, gas powered vehicles. So, you know, again, technology changes quickly. And if you think uh, about 2035, that's not that far away that we'll be in a, you know, nearly a full electric vehicle world um, when it comes to new vehicles. Um, even as it stands today, again, as I talked about how, you know, technology has changed and, you know, outside the scope of, uh, you know, passenger vehicles, uh, there's a number of advancements that have been made for, uh, you know, fleet vehicles, public transportation. This is a, a photo, obviously, here of a electric school bus. Um, uh, the city of uh, Concord has uh, deployed uh, part of their fleet to electric school buses. Um, I, I live in Newburyport, Mount Beverly's. Uh, fairly close to home here. Beverly's nearly 100% um, electric bus for their uh, fleet of school vehicles. And, you know, what's interesting about um, all electric vehicles, but certainly, you know, school buses is when we talk about, you know, what we call vehicle to, to grid integration, or really what can become a, you know, a, a secondary use for this vehicle. So if you think about, you know, the, the driving behavior of a bus, it's, Kids go to the go to school in the morning on the bus. They're or they're brought home in the afternoon, and then the bus sits pretty idle, you know, throughout the course of the day. Um, and that cascades into a much longer period of them being idle, you know, over the course of the summer. So, uh, the city of Beverly, for example, has um, you know uses their school buses uh, in a number of ways. You know, in in a power outage emergency, you know, there's the ability to um, use the uh, the charge of the battery. Uh, for the for the for the hospital, there's you know if you think about especially during the summer months when uh, school buses aren't being used, you know it, there's the ability to have the vehicle run air conditioning at like a local community center. Um, so there there's a lot of ways that these vehicles can um, you know really support different behavior than what's traditionally you know traditionally thought from vehicles. Um, Yarmouth, Maine um, is a is another area where we just did a, an installation for um, a school bus depot. So, uh, like I said, to me that when we talk about you know what's exciting with electric vehicles, to me that's one of the most exciting parts is you know how this technology can be used in in, in other ways. Um, certainly, public transportation becomes a uh, a great area that can be impacted. I know uh, doing a little reading, the uh, PBTA I see in 2021 uh, made an investment in. Uh, I think about eight million dollars in uh, public transportation and buses in the valley, which is which is outstanding to, to, to see. So, you know, not only are there benefits from an operational standpoint uh, that can be benefit, you know, that that benefits the area, but certainly, certainly a reduction in in carbon footprint is as well. Um, and that's what I'll talk a little bit more about is, you know, where we are today, and even big picture, you know, the this technology, you know, can become a little bit regionally specific. So. You know, in the valley where you are, between the you know number of individuals that live there and schools that are available, it, uh, it it's great to see that uh, electric buses are are being utilized. Um, and you know, the next piece, you know, I, I talked a little bit about electric vehicles being used for emergency situations, but there's also the ability on a community level for them to be used in a lot of fun ways. Um, so if you think about the amount of events that happen, you know, maybe over the course of the summer. Um, where power might need to be used or a generator might need to be installed. Uh, this is a photo actually from our company meeting that uh, we held up in Maine last year. So um, after a days long annual meeting, we there was a concert that was put on uh, that was fully uh, fully run and and deployed by using our fleet of uh, Ford Lightning. So you know, I mean, uh, power lasted all night. The the concert started and, and ended on time, and it was. Uh, you know, not only a lot of fun, but a uh, really just neat experience to, you know, see this this technology at the forefront today and uh, all the different ways it, it, it can be used. Uh, just for, you know, kind of size comparison, when we talk about the, you know, the battery, which is really the driving force of, of electric vehicles, uh, your, you know, typical um, passenger vehicle, and, and there's an example here of a, of a Chevy Bolt, which is a little on the smaller end, but um, that has a, you know, if I, if I get into the weeds here a little bit on, on numbers, but that has a 60 kilowatt hour battery. So, 
Uh, there might be some individuals on the call tonight who uh, maybe have installed a Tesla power line, uh, you know, at, at their house for supplemental power or backup power. Um, each type of power wall is, is about a 10 kilowatt hour battery. So if you think about a Chevy Bolt, the Chevy Bolt is now housing six Tesla power walls. Um, so not only does your, you know, passenger vehicle become, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the standard from, you know, getting from point A to point B, but that technology can now be used um, in a lot of other ways. And if you think about even the cost of installing a, a Tesla power wall, which is, you know, usually carries a price tag of, you know, ten to twelve thousand dollars. There's, you know, a sixty thousand dollar piece of technology that's residing in your car that, uh, that yeah, that can be using for your home. Um, and naturally, as the size of you know vehicles increase, uh, so does the size of the the battery to run that vehicle. So you know, school buses that I mentioned and talked quite a bit about, you know, has about fifteen of those batteries. If you look at a, a, a Proterra, you're you're getting north of of forty. So. Um, a lot of options and a lot of ways to uh, help utilize deployment, uh, you know, really, really across the board in, in a number of different areas. Quick question, Don. Yeah, fire away. Um, how many of those uh, different vehicles that you've listed so far, both of the cars and these larger ones, um, are actually easily used in reverse to, I mean, they all, I assume they all have 120 volt outlets in them somewhere. But um, not many of them can be used to power a hospital or a home or a right because that technology just isn't deployed yet. Uh, you know, guess, yeah, no, that's that, that's a great question. And um, the technology is there. It, you know, that kind of steals the thunder a little bit from my presentation, but that's OK. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's pretty specific right now when you talk about, you know, uh, you know, like I said, a bus being, you know, a backup for for a, for a hospital, which I believe Beverly has done. But, you know, even uh, more on the consumer scale, uh, we're at the point now that uh, there's essentially an inverter available that like one of our co-owners has a Ford Lightning. Um, he's recently deployed the technology at his home that he can now use his, you know, use his pickup truck to power his home in an outage or again, even uh, in times of, of peak load. So, so you're right. It's not, it's not as commonplace as, you know, taking a, a plug and, and plugging it in, but um, the technology certainly exists today. And, and I, but can you do that with, further deployment? Can you, being can you do out. that with any, with any of these electric vehicles then? I didn't think you could do it with a bolt, for example. I, you know, I don't know if you can, it might be, that might be specific to, to it's the, it's definitely the, it's definitely vehicle specific. Okay. Um, there are certain vehicles that can do it. There are certain vehicles that cannot do it. I think we're starting to see more and more vehicles with that technology um, coming as a as a standard option. Um, but it's not across the board yet. I think it. I think it will be at, in the not too distant future. Um, but Great. but that certainly not yet. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Yep. Perfect. Um, so, and that's actually a great segue when we talk about all of these vehicles and all their, uh, you know, their capabilities. But the big piece, you know, the crux of the conversation is, uh, you know, how do we make these vehicles work? And that all comes down to charging. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, uh, different technologies that exist uh, for charging. Um, you know, big picture, you know, to simplify it a little bit, you know, there's essentially um, different levels of charging. And that kind of really ties back to the, the speed that a vehicle can be charged. So uh, there's level one, level two, um, and uh, in level three, which is also known as DC fast charging. So uh, this slide's a little dry. So the next few, I think, kind of break that down uh, into something that's a little bit more relatable. So always, you know, I always find when you talk about electricity and, um, you know, and power, uh, using the analogy of, of water is a uh, uh, a pretty apt way to think about it when you talk about the flow of electrons is, is kind of similar to the flow of water. So uh, this first example here is shows you what a, a level one charger uh, looks like. Uh, essentially, every electric vehicle from the dealer is going to come with with a level one charger. Um, it's not a very fast way to charge, you know, kind of like my little friend here drinking from a, from a water fountain on a hot day. Um, but, you know, some of the benefits, it's it's really easy to use. Um, essentially, it just plugs into, you know, your standard wall outlet. So uh, there isn't the cost of, you know, doing any electrical upgrades at, at your home. Uh, but again, the, the speed of it overall is, is pretty slow. It's going to recharge your vehicle at about three to five miles per hour. So if you think about the range, as I talked about on, you know, most vehicles today, it's, you know, it's, it's up to like two days to, uh, to, to charge your vehicle. But 
um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a great simple option that, that can be used pretty much anywhere. Uh, the next piece or the next uh, level would be uh, a level two charging. Um, and kind of as the numbers imply, it's it's a more robust, uh, has more robust charging capabilities. So it, it's about four times faster than a level one. Kind of like you see uh, our little chocolate lab here drinking out of the uh, out of the sprinkler. You know, it's going to deliver about 20 to 30 miles uh, of charging per hour. Um, it does require um, a little bit more robust installation. You know, so but it's typically what you'd see, you know, what most homeowners end up uh, uh, installing for their vehicle again so they can achieve that full charge over the course of the night. Um, and it's what you it's what you usually see in a you know in a public setting, either in a parking garage or you know maybe at an office or um, at a retail location. And then the next level, um, kind of tying it together with our water analogy here, is DC fast charging or what's known as level three charging, and that's that's a a really a really robust charge very quickly. So uh, typically that'll be used intermittently. You know it won't be kind of the the, the main charging platform uh, that'll be utilized. Um, you know, it's great for occasional use that it can, you know, it can deliver up to 300 miles per hour of charging. Um, naturally, the, you know, the, the hardware is a lot more robust, so there, there's an increased cost. Um, installation's a little bit more involved where it requires higher power, three-phase power, but, you know, typically you'd see a, a driver use this for, you know, maybe like a 15 or or 20 minute session where maybe they're on a long journey, they're gonna stop at a fast charger, stretch their legs, uh, maybe grab a bite to eat, use use some amenities. And, you know, big picture when we talk about, you know, where charging needs to be deployed, it's, it's, it's really looking for um, areas that might serve a dual purpose. Um, the last example here is, is what's called a power sharing model. So basically that it gives the ability of the, the charging cluster to be, you know, a little bit more fluid and elastic to adjust um, charging based on how many vehicles are there essentially. Meaning, you know, in this example here of this cluster of Tesla chargers, you know, if one vehicle is plugged in uh, to charge, it'll be able to derive all the power that's available and, and charge very quickly. Um, as more vehicles show up, uh, basically the amount of electricity or, you know, again, water, um, could be distributed evenly across those vehicles. So it'll take a little bit longer for them to charge, uh, but everyone's going to receive the same amount of power. So um, it's a great way, like I said, for, you know, individuals and the vehicles to interact in a more kind of fluid and elastic way and for the, the technology to, uh, to adjust accordingly for a, you know, for a, a better experience. Um, as we talk, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, um, where, most charging happens. Um, this, this diagram here just really, you know, talks about two, you know, the first point being that most people are going to do a bulk of their charging at, you know, at home over the course of, over the course of the night. Um, and I know we do, you know, live in a much more virtual world uh, than we, than we have in the past case in point our, our meeting this evening. Uh, but usually the second area where people spend the most amount of their time is, you know, is at work. Um, or at their office during the, the, the course of the day. So uh, that, you know, workplace charging offers a, a really unique kind of sweet spot in the deployment of charging at this point from, you know, from a couple of different avenues. Um, like I said, number one, it's the, it's the second longest place a vehicle usually sits. So it only makes sense to have that charging happen uh, during that time. Um, but there's a lot of different, um, you know, technology options, but yeah, the point I like to make for workplace charging in Massachusetts is is where we're really blessed with the amount of you know high tech jobs that the state um, has, uh, not only from you know the tech side of the world but also in in biotech. So you know from a from a company standpoint, it can become you know offering workplace charging becomes a great way to you know foster their commitment to sustainability, you know drive their their green initiatives. Uh, but even when a business looks at, you know, kind of the the, the human resources side of the house, um, it becomes a great way to offer, you know, an additional benefit um, to their employees, uh, which can even, you know, cascade as, as we talk about the, you know, the, the the employee side of the house. You know, a lot of employers strive to to get a competitive edge in in such a competitive, um, you know, hiring list out there, and and really foster, you know, what's called an employer of choice environment. So. You know, by by making the investment 
um, and offering this benefit can be a great way for them to, you know, not only attract, but really, you know, retain top talent in, um, in their industry. So when, we, you know, I've talked a little bit about what makes a, a good site for charging. I mean, to boil it down to the most simple factor, it's, you know, it's an area where drivers will use it. Um, so like I said, you'll see a lot of uh, focus on, you know, heavily trafficked corridors at this point. Uh, but, you know, coupling that with um, an environment where, you know, it can kind of be dual purpose, you know, makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I, I, in, in addition to workplace charging, hospitality seems to be, a, you know, a, a really great fit for um, those organizations to make that investment, to offer that amenity to, you know, to their patrons. Uh, but even if you think about your day to day activities, you know, any establish, you know, retail establishments, you know, restaurants are great. Uh, you know, I know I if, if I'm going to go food shopping and there's the option of going food shopping where there's the ability to charge my vehicle versus not, uh, I lean a lot he more heavily towards the area where I can get some some charging done. Um, and again, there, there's benefits on, on the retail side as well. LL Bean in in Maine is a uh, a project that we did a, a handful of years ago, and they were really excited um, just to be able to, you know, offer that to individuals that are coming to the shore, coming to their store, um, and not only as a way to, you know, attract EV drivers, but, you know, as a way to maybe increase what they, how much time they spend in the store and, and you know, the impact that that makes in their business. So, you know, again, it's, it, it's, it's great that there's the ability to, you know, not look at the traditional you know, site options that you would look at for like a gas station where there's more increased, you know, there's increased um, uh, means necessary from, you know, a site, you know, the site standpoint, the type of work that needs to be done, what type of uh, uh, equipment needs to be put in the ground. You know, like I said, anywhere that a light can be turned on becomes a great option for a vehicle to be charged. But then again, coupling that um, so it, it really complements the driver's behavior uh, seems to be the the, the smart approach. Um, certainly all of this uh, deployment comes at a price. And, and like I said, where I feel like where we were about 15 years ago with, with solar, we're, we're kind of at the point today where, you know, there's a, a number of funding options available to uh, support the deployment of, of this infrastructure. So um, and I'll, I'll walk, walk through that in a little bit more detail, but essentially there's there's federal funding that was derived from the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, last year. Uh, state of Massachusetts has a, a program called Mass EVIP. Um, and the biggest uh, impact that's been made within the last year is from the utility companies through uh, programs that they have called Make Ready, which I'll go into some more detail on. Um, and locally, or I shouldn't say more, lo more locally, um, through... You know, throughout the state, there's a number of municipal light departments. They uh, typically all have uh, some sort of incentive that they offer for electric vehicle charging to be to be installed as well. So specifically for uh, Massachusetts, I mentioned um, the Electric Vehicle Incentive Program, which is uh, the creative name for the Mass EVA plan, um, has about $13 million available to help subsidize the cost of, of the chargers. That, that actually covers up to $50,000 per station. Uh, the really big driver, uh, as stated, is, is coming from the utilities at this point. So uh, National Grid and Eversource uh, combined have rolled out $420 million uh, to cover the cost of the charging hardware. And that's in addition to any infrastructure work, uh, meaning that if you want to put in a bank of fast chargers, that, you know, uh, there's a lot of power that needs to be derived to do so. So the utilities will actually come in, install a completely new service, and cover 100% of that cost. So if anyone's been involved in an evaluation like that for, you know, a client or a business, that usually carried a, a cost of, you know, I mean, north of six figures, probably $150,000 for a new service to be brought in from the utility. The utility will do that at no charge um, to embrace the deployment here. And then in addition to the new service, like I said, there's up to sixty thousand dollars per charging station that can be, um, you know, that can be subsidized through the the incentive plans that are available. Um, naturally, the uh, incentive and rebate uh, process can be be a little bit challenging. Um, this next slide just gives you a quick example of that. This is this was actually taken from um, EverSource's Make Ready Plan, where a 
uh, a certified installer, um, actually for Eversource and for National Grid. But in one of their deployment uh, meetings that we attended, this is literally the workflow to, you know, to realize funding from that. So uh, the point I just always put out there, it's, you know, that there's a lot of funding available, which is great, uh, but it's, it's really important to, you know, have a, a partner on a project who can help navigate that because it's certainly not easy. Um, the next few slides, as, as I kind of tie up uh, my presentation here, again, this just talks about, uh, like I said, what I think is the most exciting part of, of, of electric vehicles and, and charging. And, and again, it's the, it's the interaction um, that happens to, to the grid. So uh, on the left side of the screen, you'll see what's called uh, V1, which is just uh, almost the first level of integration to charging. And that's simply charging your vehicle, you know, plugging it into a charger, having those electrons go and charge a vehicle so it can be driven. Um, like I said, the more interesting parts of, of what we'll we'll see in the future is is the bottom piece, uh, which is vehicle to grid integration, and that's again, you know, utilizing these smart controls to um, either act as you know emergency backup or again can even be used for times to uh, deploy power from vehicles uh, during types of uh, of peak demand. Um, and then the last being um, vehicle to home which kind of brings me to, I think, my last slide here. This is a, a photo from one of our customers in, in Dover, New Hampshire, who's uh, always been a, a pillar and a very early adopter of, of clean energy. But, I mean, this is what I think the future of, of what all homes are eventually going to look like. You know, he has uh, solar voltaics for his electricity. He has solar hot water. Uh, where the heart is, there's a, there's a Tesla power wall installed. So solar panels charge um, his battery either for backup or uh, just to you know, drive power back to his home. Um, he drives an electric vehicle. And, you know, again, as I mentioned, um, the technology, we're on the cusp of the, um, you know, bi-directional charging and having your vehicle be able to, you know, to power, power your home or business. And boy, I feel like I did a lot of talking here. Uh, but with that, I will turn the presentation over here to Adam to talk about carports, unless there's any well, again, we can save, save questions to the end. Thanks, Don. Very uh, well. That's a great overview. Uh, and of course, uh, we're doing this giant transition to electric vehicles because 50% of greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. And so if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to have to tackle transportation. And EV, EVs and EV charging is, is a big piece of that, but it doesn't do us much good if we uh, just uh, generate the electricity to charge those cars with diesel uh, peaker plants or coal-fired power plants. So our solution to that in large part, of course, you've got rooftop solar and and ground mounted solar, which you all I'm sure are familiar with. Um, but we've, we've got uh, solar carports uh, that we like to uh, install in um, collaboration with the EV chargers that we, the EV charging network that we're building out as well. Uh, not just environmental reasons to, to build carports though. There's a certain uh, increase in business income that can be expected with the installation of a carport. Uh, municipalities and businesses and nonprofits have enjoyed significant returns on investment from building solar carports. And it makes them uh, that much more of an appealing choice for fueling your EV charging network. There are beyond the financial benefits, there are some additional benefits that people enjoy from parking in carports, including uh, climate management inside the vehicle, um, shelter from the elements, uh, keeping the cars cool in the summertime and keeping the snow off them in the wintertime. Uh, people really enjoy that benefit. Uh, studies show that carports and retail locations are always the first to fill. People are going to park there where possible. 
I'm sure you've all seen uh, the canopies at uh, the Mullen Center or River Valley Co-op. Um, people really like to park under covered parking. And it has a benefit to the vehicle's fuel economy, uh, sometimes reducing it by 25%. Um, from uh, preventing the heat buildup inside the vehicle. So other good reasons to install carports. Oops. So um, the 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 real benefit of solar carports is really the, the dual use aspect. You've got parking lots that are going to be there. You, you've committed to that, providing parking to, to people. Um, and there's essentially, it's essentially wasted space to not cover that with, with solar. Um, you compare that to, you know, cutting down a forest to, to put in a ground mounted solar system or taking up arable agricultural land to, to put in a ground mounted solar system. And there's real benefits to leaving the, leaving the farmland, leaving the forests, allowing them to do their piece of the carbon sequestration puzzle and using those asphalt parking lots that are going to be there anyway and using them for uh, energy generation as well. Um, you can fit a lot more solar panels on uh, on a uh, covered parking lot, and you end up reducing the maintenance of the of the asphalt because you're preventing all that UV from hitting the surface and degrading it prematurely. Get into the different design options that you can choose with carports. The first one is a T-shape uh, cantilever style that essentially has the posts run down the middle strip of uh, uh, two parking spot wide car aisle and then covers the, the two parking spots. It has a single tilt typically towards the south, but can also be oriented toward the east and west without much um, decline in production as long as it's relatively unshaded. The second type is a V-shape. Um, this helps in our location to deal with the snow a bit. In the, in the cantilever version, you've got a single till, and so it's gonna, snow is gonna fall on that, and then it's gonna slough off to the, to the low edge, um, which may uh, create some plowing difficulties uh, because Timing that the snowfall from those edges can be can be challenging, so you're not really ever sure you, when the snow is going to fall. So you can't really time the snow cleanup, and you end up potentially with some some frozen berms on that single tilt. So if you're going to my my opinion is if you're going to do one of the single tilt um, from the previous slide, you want to have those oriented sort of off of the drive path potentially. Um, into a grass area on the side, uh, if you have that um, ability. If not, the V-shape works well. It's two different pitches facing in towards each other. Um, this works best in a north-south orientation. To, if, the, if the posts of the canopy run north-south, you could pick up the, you know, the eastern sun and the western sun and, and generate a fair amount of power, but also prevent that, uh, those snow berms from forming um, when, when the snow melts. Uh, as, as an option, you can add water management to a canopy. They don't typically, water management is not included in a solar carport. The panels cover what they will and they're, they're, the panels are generally something like six feet by four feet, um, really rough numbers there, but the, between the panels is a little gap. And so 
uh, rain will go through the gas, but it's it's a much reduced sort of intensity of rain because it's only falling every so often. Um, when people want a true weatherproof structure, they'll put in water management. They'll put in basically a, a, a small roof surface underneath the solar system so that it can catch the water and an internal drain system will run that water to um, out to the existing drainage of the property. But that we don't see that very often because it adds a fair expense and we find that folks don't tend to mind the, the smaller amount of weather that it does get through. So that is the, the V shape. And then the next one that I'll talk about is the long span. So this is basically the, the most power dense of the options and, and it covers both the drive aisles as well as the parking spots and tends to, to be uh, the most cost efficient style. Um, so it ends up being a bit more monolithic, but ends up being the most um, cost effective and energy effective option that we have. And then you can take that long span and you can actually put it on top of a parking garage. So a lot of people complain that, you know, they don't want to park on the top floor of the parking garage because you get all that, you know, the, you're parking your car in the hot sun in the summertime and you're parking it in the elements in the wintertime. Putting a nice carport level over the top of that helps to, to prevent that. It reduces the maintenance of the asphalt underneath it. And yeah, makes it, makes it more, uh, appealing place to park while generating that uh, clean solar electricity that ostensibly you want for your EVs that are parking there. And that's what I've got for carports. And I would be happy to open the floor to any questions that we have out there. All right, so at this point, I bet there are a lot of questions. If you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, whether you're in the audience or on the panel. And I see Jesse has his hand up. First of all, thank you both for joining us. Um, this is really great. I took a bunch of screenshots, stole some information along the way. That was fun. Good. I'm curious, and I, I know, I'm sure this is the first and most annoying question you always get, but. As far as a dollars per watt installed, and without, I don't even necessarily need you to give a number, but if, if you have one, great, or even a range. But more particularly, where does it compare to like residential rooftop solar or, you know, field solar? Like, so where do these carports tend to sit in that, in that range of, or what is, what is a, typical range of dollars per watt installed. Sure. Now, are we talking for you specifically, Jesse, or are we just talking for, for the general public? <laughs> well, I'm just kidding. That's, I'd, a, that's a joke. I'd like, I'd like <laughs> 50KW over my, drive, my driveway, if you don't mind. Yep, yep sure. Um, so there, there's significant infrastructure investment to the carport that you don't have with a roof mount, right? You're, you're putting concrete and steel in the ground uh you're pushing these things up it's not always steel you could also do like a timber frame we've done we, we have some partners that do timber frame style so you can have a fairly nice aesthetic at the residential scale um steel tends to be cheaper and more you know e easier to install for much larger scale uh carports um, but it really does depend on the size of it um, the, the more you put in the, the less cost per watt that you'll have, um, because there's so much that goes into the engineering and, and sorting out the, the basic idea of the thing that once you've got that, it's, it's so much easier to sort of replicate it again and again and again for that location. Yeah. So, so definitely more expensive, um, there are, for that reason, the, the state is offering additional smart incentives for carports um, on, the, on the larger scale. Um, but I would say 
you know, your most your most cost effective carport is one that is commercial scale. Yeah. But we do see we do see people who like they want a parking canopy in their yard. They're gonna do a parking canopy anyway. So put some solar on it, you know, and, and so that happens and we've got we've got a nice partnership with local timber framer and and can do that. Um, it just doesn't happen very often because you're basically building a car, you're you're, you're building a parking canopy and then you're putting solar on it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it, I, yeah, I think of this as mostly a commercial mm. application, which makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Dwayne? You're muted, Dwayne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was busy trying to put my hand down. No, I see I'm muted. But okay, first, I was, uh, thank you both to both of you for great uh, information presentations. Uh, I'll stick with the canopies first. And just on on not so much associated lining line of questions, what um, there's a lot of parking lots, <laughs> um, in, lot of parking in, lots. Well, around the world around around the country and uh you know, you know maybe not huge amounts in amherst itself um except for the university there are some but there, you, there are plenty of parking lots in hadley for example um what what are what what i wouldn't say pushback but feedback do you get from potential sites um of these types of um commercial facilities um that make it are, are sort of barriers to um, progressing this more actively um, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, I, there's a lot of interest public in the public. Um, there's there is the smart incentives um, that may, it should make it a bit more competitive with other solar. Um, uh, so what are, what what sort of the pushback or, or problems that you face um, when you uh, try to get commercial facilities to do this? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think the upfront cost is is one. Jesse kind of nailed that. Um, I think two, there is there is some development work that needs to happen because we need to to know the the actual final design of the carport, which dictates the price of the amount of steel needed to support the system, as well as the depth of the um, foundations, the concrete that needs to go in the ground, there's what's what we call geotechnical uh, engineering that needs to happen where they're digging more test pits in the ground. They're analyzing the soil for its weight bearing capacity for its, you know, for how well it's going to prevent that um, concrete from shifting side to side under wind loads, that kind of thing. And in order to do all that um, testing and then engineering work, it's a, it's a, a fair amount of money to do that work. And you're sort of doing it a little bit at risk because you don't know if you're what, if you're going to like the final number, you can kind of get sort of random order of magnitudes and the way that we've dealt with that in the industry is to, to kind of give a, a high number. So people won't be, you know, ho hopefully we'll come in less than that, but then that high number can really sort of be off putting to people. So it, it it takes a I think it takes a good partnership and I think it takes a willingness to to sort of in for a penny in for a pound in that engineering piece of it and and working with a trusted partner who you know is is working in your best in, interest and and isn't just you know in it to make a quick buck or something like that I think goes a long way. Thank then you. there's you know zoning and all all that, but well. I'm sure the town would be very <laughs> helpful for hmm. making the, such a thing happen, you know, but, but some, you, you can run into challenges with certain towns, you know, uh, certain members of zoning boards can, you know, may, may think a carport is, is something like an aesthetic eyesore or mm -hmm. something and, and say, Oh, we don't want to see something like that. Um, I would can I just jump in? I, I want to say that, sure. you know, some of the challenges I think that we face with the carports are, and I think you pointed out, you know, you have to put in some kind of stormwater management system, but also some sites need to be graded. So you're not, it's not like you just go in and stick these carports up. You know, there's so much more infrastructure that has to be addressed that makes it, so it's not just the cost of the installation of the technology, it's all of the other infrastructure 
things that you need to address on top of that. So there might be funding right. available for the carport, but you don't necessarily have the funding to put in the stormwater management system. So that's, I think, yeah. some of the challenges the communities face. Yeah, that's you're absolutely right, Stephanie. And all that circles back to what my response to, to Jesse's question, which was, you know, all that is sort of fixed upfront cost. And so the bigger solar system you put in, the more income it generates to help pay for that sort of initial upfront fixed cost. That you can't really get around all of that engineering and, and zoning work that needs to be done. That's a, that's a great point. I think mm -hmm. we have a question here yes. from Julian. I'm going to allow him to talk. Go okay. ahead, Julian. You can unmute yourself. Hi, thanks Hi, so much. Uh, awesome to have this presentation. I thank uh, Laura for inviting me. That was great. And um, I had a few questions, um, more on the municipal side of things about electric vehicles. So like, I know the town recently in its capital budget has purchased a new electric school bus, or I think two of them actually, which is fabulous. Um, but in terms of like other town vehicles, um, I'm looking at like a small van for the recreation department in town is about 60,000. Uh, public works pickup truck is about 60,000. A police cruiser is approaching 80,000. Um, so what I'm wondering is with these vehicles, which I mean, to a consumer seems pretty expensive vehicle is like, what would a comparable electric option cost? Like maybe a Ford Mustang Mach-E or a F-150 Lightning, like would the costs be relatively comparable? And if not, how quickly could we recoup those costs if we decided to slowly transition our fleet in that direction? Do you want me to take this one, Don? Uh, sure. Yeah. It, so it ties nicely to your last your your last response. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to take it. So the uh, you know the cost of electric vehicles has historically been slightly higher than you know the standard internal combustion engine counterparts. Um, you you can get electric vehicles for less cost than internal combustion engine in some cases today. Like I think you can get the base Ford Lightning F-150 is like 50,000 bucks. So that's comparable to, you know, it's internal combustion engine counterpart. Right now, the there are a couple of different incentive programs to try to help level that playing field. Um, one of them is the federal EV tax credit, which gives up to $7,500 uh, it used to be a tax credit. Now they're do they're doing it as a rebate at the dealership. So um, that's seventy five hundred dollars in some cases. In other cases, thirty seven fifty. Not not every vehicle qualifies for it. So you really have to um, assess that. And there are different sort of like income things. So if if you're a millionaire, you're probably not going to get the, the 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 leg up that people of more moderate income might get from that tax credit. The other off, uh, opportunity that we have is the the more EV rebate in Massachusetts, which in some cases gives up to, I think, $7,500 or $8,500 um, for a pickup truck. So that's $15,000 off a pickup truck right there um, if it qualifies for the Massachusetts State More EV Grant and the federal tax credit. Um, so a couple of really nice options there. Then, of course, we're talking about reducing um, – operating costs right. so you have to look at both fuel and operations and maintenance um there you know there's no oil to change you know there's no spark plugs to to swap there's no engine tunings there's no belts you know all, all that stuff is no longer exists in the ev version um and the cost of electricity you know th then there's the cost of electricity versus the cost of fossil fuels and you know which ones uh how those compare i think um historically the cost of electricity has been significantly less than fossil fuels i think what we saw last year was that uh electricity prices crept up sort of beyond what we had expected um so in order to deal with that i, I really suggest you get a solar system <laughs> hmm. Yeah, thank which thank, makes which makes it free. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much. Um, I guess my follow up question would be more for Stephanie. If 
the town is the town eligible for some of these grants if we could be saving ten, fifteen thousand dollars on a vehicle and moving away from internal combustion engines, is the town eligible or not? Yeah, and we've used we have used those um programs for the purchase of so of some of the vehicles. Um but we're limited like in the you know, depending on the the criteria at the time, um, because these things kept getting revised, you know, pretty much annually. And so um, the last time I think we were wanting to use the Mass EVIP program, we couldn't because we were going to be purchasing hybrid police vehicles. So they haven't gone 100% to EVs, but they've transitioned to hybrids for some of the newer police vehicle purchases. Um, so we use some sustainability funding to sort of bridge what would have come from the Mass EVIP program, we use sustainability funding to cover that difference. Um, but I will say, and I was going to raise my hand actually to say that um, the Green Communities Program, as part of that participation in that program, we have to have a Green Fleets policy, which we have, um, and then it sort of gives us standard um, miles per gallon sort of fuel estimate of what our vehicles need to, you know, we need to meet those requirements, those guidelines. And that is going to be changing, I think, in 2025, where if there's an electric version of a vehicle that's being replaced, you have to replace it with an electric vehicle. So the state's sort of transitioning us. Um, so even if we're not doing that currently, we're going to have to um, in the next few years. What, what year did you say that was, Stephanie? I, missed. I think it's 2025. That was the last I saw. I mean, mm -hmm. again, I, I want to double check, but um, my understanding was that they're going to be transitioning that requirement to, to 2025. Cool. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, we have Steve and Dwayne and have their hands up. So Steve, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Don and Adam. <clears throat> Are there things that uh, this committee could do, the ECAC, to... That you that you suggest that we could do to help increase the number of solar canopies and or car chargers in the town of Amherst. <laughs> you know, you know the community better than I. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think a, a big part of it is, you know, is, is education and you know, kind of evangelizing the these technologies. So. You know, I think community involvement and connections that you have just to open up a, a, a dialogue for evaluating these things is is probably the most the most impactful. All right. You know, that's the sort of thing we do. I was wondering if there were bottlenecks that you see as um, developers of these technologies that you <clears throat> wish weren't as time consuming or frustrating to deal with that you know, maybe there's something that we could help to remove those bottlenecks, at least at a town scale. You know, we're not going to be able to do much with a statewide incentive program, but at a local level. Something that comes to mind to me is developing, you know, a longer range plan. If we're going to move from one in five EVs on the road to four and five in the next 10 years, where are those where are those chargers going to be? <laughs> where are we going to where are we going to do that? Um is that going to be in the in the in the bigger municipal lots? Is that going to be uh, street side? Uh, are and and same with carports, you know. And then how are we going to pr provide uh, the electricity for those? Um, developing an idea about whether the town wants to to own that and develop that, or if they want uh, to put out an RFP for people to come in and say, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to build out these 20 parking spots with charging infrastructure. Um, I think, I think right now is the time to start coming up with the plan for, mm. for how the town wants to best manage uh, this sort of, what, it's, it's, it's an inevitability at this point. We're all going to be driving these electric vehicles. We're all going to need places to charge. Um, how do we do that in a way that, you know, is in alignment with the rest of the town's goals uh, and, and planning? I don't think that conversation is happening a lot out there around the state. I don't honestly don't know. Maybe we're all are already doing that. Of course, you lead the way on so many things. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that's that's one thing that comes to mind. Okay, good, thank you. Um, um, okay, so we are running out of time, so let's try to keep these short, but I got Dwayne and Laura, and then we still have to open the floor for comments uh, to, to close the meeting, before we close the meeting. So um, Dwayne, go ahead. Yeah, just, and it follows up actually on, on just what was being discussed. Well, as we get to four, four or five cars, EVs, and then five to five, five of five cars, EVs, um, it seems to me the 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 uh, a primary thing that's keeping say families from buying uh, replacing their fossil their uh, just take me for example we got an EV uh, I have an EV it works great I'm fine with charging and all that no no issues no range anxiety but I need to use the fossil the gasoline car when we go on long trips mm -hmm. and we can't we can you know families can't sort of have have a non EV need to have a non EV vehicle to allow for longer trips, which are is pretty critical. So as we get to like all electric vehicles, it seems like the highway systems, fast charging on the highway systems is what's really needed. My question is, do you know what Massachusetts is doing with regard to that uh, on the Mass Pike 495, so forth? Don, you want to tackle that one? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, Mass has been a little bit lower to react than than some other states um like interestingly enough you know um our company was founded in maine maine is um is light years ahead and i think part of it is you know i'll take a step back you know on a federal level um some of the funding options that have been rolled out are under a, a plan called nevi which is the national electric vehicle so state of massachusetts from that federal funding has received 60 million dollars in in funding options it's just now a matter of coming up with the parameters to make that deployment happen. So, you know, I think Mass has been a little more conservative in kind of looking at what some other states have done. So, you know, any challenges or, you know, problems that happen aren't, aren't replicated. So, so the plan's there. I mean, a, a robust um, RFI um, as well as RFP were, were issued. Um, it's nice that they opened it to public comment initially, which uh, us and, and a number of others installers provided feedback for. Um, but they're still in that process of really kind of digesting for for full deployment. So, you know, the the funding metric is there from a federal level. Um, like I said, there, there's funding that's been been approved here. It's now it's really a matter of, you know, how is the program going to work? How is it going to be deployed? Uh, but certainly, first and foremost, they've identified those what they call alternative fuel corridors or, or the highways, basically, to be the first area of deployment. And to receive that funding, there, there are parameters that need to be involved. You know, some of the things I talked about, like um, you know, there need to be amenities available. You know, it can't just be, you know, off the highway, off in the woods. There, there needs to be, um, you know, there needs to be a restroom available. There, there need to be some sort of amenities there for the driver. So, you know, like I said, I, I feel like where we were with solar, you know, over a decade ago, that we're, we're at the beginning of, of the tidal wave to happen. It's just, it's, you know, the, that, that initial deployment is is always the most challenging. It's, it's... Thank you. Those corridors, I think, are, are what, route to... I ninety, I ninety one, yeah, the, the and Beltway, yep, yeah. and then out the Cape, Route six, um, twenty four, so you know, they, well, twenty four, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they've they've identified some sort of main arteries that they want uh, all of us developers to figure out how you know where where do we put a, a charging station spaced out appropriately one every 50 miles is the parameter okay. with amenities as don said so we're, we're working on figuring that out but Maine's main already issued its nevi grants and we've already we're already building under nevi grants in maine we're already building under nevi grants in new hampshire yeah um so we're 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 massachusetts yeah. well yeah. we like to make it a little difficult a little know? bit of red tape we need to navigate yeah. through let me let me try to to cut it short a little bit i see stella but Sorry. i also see two people from our attendees um, Shoshana Great. King and Martha. Uh, Stella, would you mind if I let some of the attendees ask questions first? No, that's fine. This was also going to be public comment because it's my daughter who has a really quick question. Uh, okay, so are we moving to Shoshana or Martha? Yeah. Do you have a public comment or do you have questions for Don or Adam? Shoshana, I'm giving you the ability to talk. So you can Thank go you. ahead and unmute. Um, uh, my name is Shoshana King. I'm a resident of Amherst. Um, I was interested in um, 
just bringing up the fact that there's a lot of apartment complexes that have a lot of residents with a lot of cars and a lot of parking lot space. Um, I think it would be advantageous for us to not forget about the renters in our community for um, having the advantages of EV plugins at their residences. It's a great Can point. Just jump in we definitely need one? to do that. Really quickly, yeah. yep, go ahead, um, Eversource has had a program um, at least a year or two ago, maybe it was a little longer, but they had an EV Make Ready program where um, we actually did uh, have one of our um, multifamily unit housing landlords or owners install EV charging at their complex. Yeah. So yeah. when those programs come up, we do actually try to make that known you know, to the to the business community, we send information to the Chamber of Commerce. So um, I don't, I, I'm not really clear what um, Eversource's current program actually allows for commercial, but certainly when those opportunities exist, we try to let them know about it. And, and if you know about any Shoshana, you know, let, let us know. Um, we're always on the lookout for stuff. Uh, we only have so much bandwidth between us. Um, and yep, it's and they're, always yep. great when we can get the landlords involved. Okay. Yep, and there are still those make ready program funds available. So, ah, yeah. excellent. And on a big level, I know the state has identified multi unit dwelling as, you know, a major challenge that needs to be solved, to your point, Shoshana. So, um, you know, they're aware of it. Interestingly enough, there was a news story last week, two weeks ago. Maura Healy uh, just freed up about $50 million in funding to the Mass Clean Energy Council to tackle this specifically to, to try to talk about deployment of. Um, like sidewalk charging, you know, uh, put chargers on light posts, maybe replace parking meters to help address the, uh, you know, the, the renters or, or not homeowners, uh, people that that live in multi-unit dwellings to have an option to charge as well. So um, it's, an, it's an area that's been identified. Thank you. Um, so uh, Stella, if yours is, uh, uh, Martha, is your comment uh, for or a question for Don and Adam, or do you have a public comment? Go ahead, Martha, you can unmute. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Martha Hanner from Amherst, and thank you very much. Uh, back to the question of the carports. Is, are there any creative ways to help jumpstart the, or somehow decrease the upfront investments and encourage grocery stores and shopping malls and so on? It, you know, These are the obvious places for solar panels, and yet, that's such a big initial block. Are there, are there, do you folks have any ideas of things that could be done to help reduce the costs or spread out the costs or anything? I think it's a great question, Martha. It's the answer is probably longer than we have time for tonight, <laughs> but, but those are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking for sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, no answer, huh? Well, I just, yeah, no, I'm, I'm no sorry. Easy we're, answer. We, we're working on it every day. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the question is how do you get the owners of the properties interested? All right. Because there are incentives and things out there, but you have to get them interested. Right. And there, and there, oh, sorry. I was uh, just going to say that there, there are, um, you know, people are motivated by many, many different things. Um, and so it really matters. It, it tends to be case by case, certainly financial incentives tends to be a, a fairly common one. And I'm sure that if we provided uh, support for that development work upfront, that that would, to help sort of de-risk it a little bit, that that would probably spur things along so significantly. Also, I will add that newer construction under the specialized code and the stretch code are going to require new construction to include um, EV parking uh, yeah. and charging stations. So yeah. that's great. part that's of that new yeah. regulatory structure. Yes. And will you come to the Sustainability Festival on April 20th? We, <laughs> we I believe we're going to be there. Good. I'll invite I them. So. <laughs> Just yeah. talk to me. I'll, I'll talk to Lydia. <laughs> uh, yeah, talk to Lydia. Talk to Lydia. She's the one who really makes it happen. <laughs> All right. So now, um, Stella, I, your hand is still there. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is. A, it is actually a question. Rosalind, okay, do you want to ask a question? Um, 
since there are so many electric cars here, are all the electric cars not electric, but some half electric, half um gas? That's right. There are some cars that are all electric, and there are some cars that are half electric, half gasoline. So they're starting to make their way from being gasoline cars to electric cars, and they're sort of in the middle of that yeah. transition. Good question. Good question. Oh, we're going to say it again. Like half in the middle, and like I think <laughs> I think it's more like half half the time electric, half the time gasoline. Half the time electric, half the time gas. Yeah, they, they run on electric until the battery runs out, and then they run on gas until you recharge them. Yeah, but I think they're right. The gas engine is in the front, and the electric motor and battery tend to be in the back and at the wheels. Ah, right, right. <laughs> good, point. good point, youngster. So half and half. <laughs> I got it. Now I got half it. Half and half. <laughs> good questions. Good questions. Mm. So with that, I'd like to thank um, thank Adam and Don again. Um, thank you as well. And I think for the it's late, My so pleasure. we should let them go. Um, but we will still complete the meeting. We have a few more minutes left in our meeting. So um, thank you again, Adam and Don. Okay, I appreciate your coming. Thanks. Today. Yeah, sure. And if you have other questions, feel free, feel free to reach out. Uh, Lydia can can get you in touch with us. We can answer any other questions you all might have, or that might come up afterwards. Great. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you both. Yep, You're bye. welcome. Bye. Okay, so I think um, there were no more ECAC member update dates. Any more updates? If not, let's go ahead and open the floor for attendee questions or comments. Any questions or comments coming from the? Oh, kitty cat. If not, I think the only thing left is a move to adjourn. Is there a move to adjourn and go celebrate Valentine's Day? I can move to adjourn. The first draft of that question was why are not all cars electric? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. More of a philosophical, <laughs> historical question. They should, have been, they should have been electric from the start 100 years ago. No. Well, they I were. Think, I think they were. Yeah, they right. were. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. yeah. But, but batteries weren't very good back then. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and Dwayne, as I'm sure you know, the the, the marketing and, and <laughs> public opinion was in the, there. There was a whole system of battery exchange in New York City at the turn of the century and yeah. electric and and then those were deemed um weak and cars for women and that was the whole marketing campaign uh, well, that yeah. if your car your car had to be loud and belching yeah. fumes if otherwise you weren't a man so there's an incredible yeah there's an incredible history uh -huh. there of 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 misinformation as there is for most aspects of our life that we take. Jesse, that's a topic for our next webinar, which you will be giving. <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing a professor from Mount Holyoke College. Oh, okay. okay. Probably do a better job than me. <laughs> All right, but with that, we have a move to adjourn. We have a second. I will move to adjourn. Second, I don't think we need to vote Given the time. <laughs> you can just adjourn. Good, yes. so let's just adjourn now. Think, Yeah. All right, then. Here. Bye, all. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Don't Bye. forget.